action? We started writing the script in November of 2019. Uh, it took us about two months to complete. And during that time, we were developing the looks of our characters, uh, what, the, what their masks would look like, how they would differentiate from one another. Uh, and with the way that we have our version of the Lord of the SCP Foundation, everyone is basically private military contractors. We took about a month or so using a Milanote to draw up different concepts for each character. We had a mood board of several different special operators, like with their ventilation systems, just to kind of see like, okay, like what can we, what can we get for a reasonable amount of money to translate what we have in the script to the screen. We also decided to go with different nationalities for some of the, the characters. Uh, some, one of them was from Great Britain, one was from Italy, one was from France, and one was a, a second generation Polish immigrant. And the reason why we wanted to do that is because we, we wanted to show the reach that the foundation has, that it's not strictly uh, exclusive to the United States. The reason why we also had paint jobs on all of their masks was so it would be easier for the audience to identify whose voice belongs to who. And we know that it seems a little goofy, but that was, since we're on, you know, on a shoestring budget, that was our primary reason for doing that. Minimalist setup that we decided to go for with them, with it just being just the plate carrier, the backpacks, the masks and the helmets and the mounted contacts, based around speed. So we only had five days to shoot everything and we had about 200 shots that we needed to get. So we needed them to be able to just throw on their gear as quickly as possible and be able to move to the next location or move to the next room or wherever and be ready to go at, at a moment's notice. These are actually super easy to make with the Kinkos. Hmm. Like regular printer paper, laminated, and then just Velcro, like the scratchy side with the window cut out, and then the scratchy side on this side. And then there you go. Just like the real ones too. Yeah, like you don't you don't have to like because like because the thing the issue that I was having is like a lot of companies don't let you buy in bulk of like several numbers like one through ten. Hmm. It's always like bulk of the same thing. It's like I don't need the same fucking thing. So all the gear for the main cast, uh, the raid team for Epsilon Six was all sponsored gear, for the exception of their clothing that they wore underneath everything. Uh, most of that was either supplied by me or uh, themselves. Uh, but the gears like their plate carriers, their helmets, their weapons, their their gloves or the, the Kydex holsters that we had them set up with, it just added to this streamlined look, especially with the Armitus 2 plate carriers that LBX sent us, was a great addition to the look of the characters because we wanted to have like a futuristic look while maintaining a private military contracting uh, style to the group. So our main goal was to make sure that the image looked good. So we decided to go with dubbing again, just like what we did with Dollhouse. The only difference was we decided to outfit their masks with custom made VPUs. So in post-production, we would have a little bit more leeway with how we were able to make the voices sound. And with that in mind, we were able to rewrite certain lines if we needed to, add things, extend scenes, and if there was ever a continuity error or any problems with the pacing of a scene, we were able to change that, which is the main reason why we decided to go that route again. We arrived a day early uh, to set up the effigy and decorate the interior of the house. Most of the house we kind of left alone. Uh, it was a Airbnb that we had found. It was located in Bland, Missouri, which is about like an hour southeast of Jeff City and it had pretty much everything that we needed. It had the woods, the field where we burned the effigy, and the property was about 140 acres or so. Day one, few discrepancies, but this is the most important shot, and we have probably the best lighting conditions right now, and I'm really thrilled about it. This is gonna look really good, especially against all this uh, green. When we were setting up the effigy, uh, it came in pieces. It was designed by our production designer, Corey Hinesley. When we set it up, it took us maybe about 20 minutes or so. We just bolted everything together. This thing was about 12 feet tall, 10 feet wide. We soaked it in diesel overnight, 
uh, because it has a very low flash point and we didn't want to use gasoline because gasoline is very volatile. Uh, one of our main cast who plays Basson, his name is uh, John Chavez, was actually a firefighter. So he helped oversee the whole process to make sure that everything that we were doing was safe. When it came to be time to set the effigy on fire, we sprayed it down with diesel again and then we used kerosene to, as an accelerant to help ignite it. We were only actually able to do it once because we didn't have multiple effigies, we only had one. Uh, so the shot that you see is actually the only take that we got. So the same tactical advisor that we used on Dollhouse returned. We know that there were, there are some things that we could have changed, but for the sake of you know, translating it to screen and also with limited time, my primary objective was to try to get it as close as possible as I could, since it is a common theme that in Hollywood movies they don't really uh, portray military tactics accurately, and they usually just kind of do their own thing. And that was something that I wanted to avoid as much as possible with this. Corey Haynes, who was Jansen in the film, actually served in Iraq, and he led over about 200 combat missions, if I remember correctly. So whenever Ty was unavailable on set, he actually filled in and he helped us uh, do some of the room clearing towards the end of the film uh, and the scene whenever they actually exfil from the house. And I, for the most part, from, from a lot of the comments and some of the people that we had the privilege of knowing throughout uh, making this film that did serve in the military, they were mostly satisfied with it. So I, I consider that a win, <laughs> especially with what we had to work with. The first day we actually fell behind and we had to unfortunately overlook some details that I only realized when came time to edit the film. The second day, we ended up being about a 16 hour day or so. In one of the sequences where they're in the bedroom and the door opens, and that's when they realize uh, with the camera that there's a creature that the cameras can see, but they can't see themselves. That whole scene was shot at night. We had the window with a sheet of diffusion on it, and we had uh, two 1200 HMIs that were shooting through it for our window light. And then in the hallway, we had two Draycast LEDs on either end at full power to push in the, the daylight from the foyer uh, at the front of the house and the window that was at the end of the hallway. I think that kind of messed with a lot of us because it, we kept thinking that it was in the afternoon, but when all the lights went off, it was it was completely dark. It kind of it made you feel like you were in a casino because you had no point of reference uh, as to what time of day it was. But that was something that I thought was really cool because um, I never had the opportunity to do that. So it was a really good learning experience for me. With the time restraints in place though, most of the film, I, I'd say about 85% of it was actually shot all in natural light. With the exception of the scenes that we shot at night and we had to make it look like it was daytime. So to achieve atmosphere for this piece, we used a fogger for our exteriors and a hazer for our interiors. Uh, the fogger definitely added a lot of depth to the woods, especially whenever the sun would come through the clouds, we would get those nice god rays that you see at the beginning. And in the interior of the houses, whenever the sun would come through the main windows in the foyer, we would also get those god rays as well. But using these tools um, allows us to make the scene feel larger and more alive. And it's something that I highly recommend that uh, indie filmmakers use to their advantage, especially if you don't have an entire production house at your disposal. I've been asked about all the long takes that I add in some of my films and why I choose to shoot a scene in one continuous shot versus breaking it up. And I believe that with the context of the film, it makes you feel like you're with the team, that you're, you're clearing the house with them or you're standing in the same room with them. Uh, it also allows me to use natural light to my advantage. Uh, you can see more of the house, you have more, uh, you, have a, you have a bigger idea of how large the space is and where everything is. I think it just adds m more tension as well when you don't really know what to expect in a one long continuous shot versus uh, having a scene split up. I feel like a lot of people nowadays, since it's very common in uh, big budget movies, that they kind of already know what to expect versus just having 
when when you're just there with them, like you just kind of think, well, anything can happen at this point. For this one, we went the same route that we went with Dollhouse. We used a Ronin S and an A7 III as our primary camera. Uh, we used an A7S II for parts of the briefing scene, so we could maintain that natural light look where the main source of light was just from the projector. And for the slow motion shots, which I think there was only about four in, we used the Arri Alexa LF for that because the other cameras that we were using did not have uh, slow motion capabilities. Now, a few people have asked, like, if we had access to an Alexa, why didn't we use it for this? And the main reason was we needed a compact camera system and we needed to move as quickly as possible. A lot of the spaces in the film were about two by three feet. And there's no way we would be able to get a fully rigged out Alexa, like, in that space with a group of people. So using the a7 III and the a16 to 35 G Master lens, we were able to get right in front of our talent and be face to face with them while still maintaining uh, all the detail and all the people that we needed to have in the scene. Another reason too is the weight. Um, since we were moving so fast and the conditions were very hot and humid, uh, it's, it's just easier for me to not have to worry about burning myself out with all that weight. Run and gun, ready to go, no issues. We'd like to thank all of our sponsors and Kickstarter backers for their support for us over the past year. If you would like to support us in our next film, go ahead and follow our social media or join our Discord server.